The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an equitable education fund. Tonight's FBI file, Deadlier Than the Mail. Keeping a record of America's army of criminals is an overwhelming job. To give you some idea of the enormity of the task, it is only necessary to tell you that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has on file in Washington, D.C., in its criminal fingerprints files, the prints of more than seven and a half million Americans who possess arrest records. Stop for a moment and think of what that figure means. Purely in terms of statistics, that means more than one in every 19 people in the United States. If you believe that those figures will be of interest only to those who have daily contact with known criminals, you are mistaken. This current crime wave can affect everything you hold dear, including your personal freedom. That is true because the basis of your freedom, your individual share of our national liberty, is based upon our common regard and respect for the law. For that reason, it should be your selfish motive to aid yourself by doing your part in helping to end the current crime wave. Tonight's file opens on the main thoroughfare of a large eastern city. It is mid-afternoon. A tall, attractive girl is walking along the crowded sidewalk when she hears someone call her name. Huh? Claire! Oh, hi, Betty. Hi. Well, for goodness sakes, what are you doing in town? I just came in a few weeks ago. Oh, well... You busy right now? Uh Uh-uh. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Okay. I was thinking about you the other day. What have you been doing, Betty? Oh, I'm still married to those three soldiers. You're married to three soldiers? Yeah. Oh, that's patriotic. It ain't very profitable, though. Gee, the way prices are these days, Mm -hmm. the three allotment checks don't pay expenses. Hold it, honey. Wait for the light. Oh. Betty, how would you like to get some action? Doing what? I'm working for Helen Webster at the Hi-Hat Club. Hostess? Yeah, Want me to see if she can use another girl? No. All you have to do is sit around and drink with the customers. But suppose you don't like them. Honey, were you in love with all the soldiers you married? I was very fond of every one of them. Can we cross now? Mm-hmm. Claire, how much does Helen pay you? Seventy-five a week and a percentage. Oh, that ain't bad. Want me to tell her about you? Do you get to meet many interesting people? Sure. Want me to talk to her? Okay, maybe I'll get to meet some new husbands. A few days later, at the local FBI field office, policewoman Sally Russell has just come in to see Special Agent Jim Taylor. Hello, Sally. Hello, Jim. Uh, Sit down, won't you? Thanks. SAC just called and said you were on your way in here. He thought you might be the one who could give me some help. The FBI is always ready to help a fair damsel in distress. (laughs) Why, thank you, kind sir. (laughs) Now, what's your trouble, Sally? There's been a series of robberies of couples who were in parked cars. You read about them in the papers? Mm. They've labeled them Lover's Lane stick-ups. No, no, I haven't seen any of the local papers recently, Sally. I just got back from working on a case upstate. Well, they've been pretty much up in arms. Uh Running editorials again? Denouncing the police commissioner? Worse than that. They've implied that every one of us on the force is just letting these stick-ups happen without doing anything about them. 
No, they should know better than that. Well, tell me, have you gotten any descriptions of the holdup men? No. They all wear masks. Oh. Besides, all of the male victims seem to have been drinking so heavily that they don't remember much. I assume these male victims had girls with them. Yes, but we haven't found any of the girls. How could that happen? None of the victims knew the girl he was with. Each of them claims he picked up his female companion. Well, have you got a list of the places where they met? We don't need a list, Jim. Why not? In every case, the victim picked his girl up at Helen Webster's nightclub. Helen Webster. Webster, that name name sounds familiar. She runs the hi-hat club. Oh. You probably remember her name because she was in trouble for clipping servicemen during the war. Yes, yes, I do, Sally. Well, has anybody confronted Helen Webster with this evidence? Yes, my inspector went to see her yesterday. What'd she say? She was obviously prepared for the visit. She claims she's running a legitimate nightclub and that it's impossible for her to stop her customers from mingling. Could any of the girls be identified by the victims? No. The memories were too clouded with drink. Hmm. Sally, I assume the SAC explained to you that there's nothing we can do about this situation unless it violates one of the federal statutes over which we have jurisdiction. Yes, he did, Jim. Okay. I'm afraid Webster is too smart to do anything like that. But I think you might help me identify one of the girls involved. Be glad to. We have a record on her. What's her name? I'm not sure. Take a look at the checks in this envelope. Okay. The U.S. government allotment checks made out to uh, three different people. That's right. There was a stick-up last night out by the lake. This envelope with the three checks in it was found near where the car was parked. I see. It's possible that a girl who was picked up at Helen Webster's dropped that envelope. I'd like you to find out what you can about those allotments. I'll send them down to Washington immediately, Sally. And as soon as I get any word, I'll call you. If I'm not at headquarters, you can probably find me at the Hi-Hat Club. How come? I've been assigned to wear an evening gown and get a job as a hostess at the place. You what? If all goes well, starting tonight, I'll be a pickup girl. Send for me? Yes, Claire. I want to talk to you. Oh? Sounds like a beef. It is. What's with that girl you brought here? Betty? Yeah. What's the matter with her? She's your friend, don't you know? Well, she's not very bright, if that's what you mean. Claire, you know I usually have every girl who works here start out just being a hostess. Mm -hmm. I made an exception in her case because of your recommendation. You mean letting her go out with customers? Yeah. What did she do wrong? She got out of the car with a guy just before the stick-up. You mean when they parked? Yeah. You want to see me? Yeah, come in. Hi, Claire. Betty, Helen tells me when you parked with that guy last night, you both left the car. That's right. You were told to stay in a car when you parked. But it was such a nice night, and Joey said, let's take a walk, so what could I say? Joey? My date. He was an awful nice fella. Al had to look for you for five minutes before he could stick you up. I meant to come right back, but my purse fell open, and it took time to pick things up in the dark. Look, young lady, I got a big investment here. Oh, I know that. By the middle of November, Fort Hopkins is going to be filled with young 19-year-old soldiers. There's a bundle to be made off them, and I intend to make it. You should. But I won't if I get thrown a curve by a stupid slob like you. Oh. I'm awful sorry I did what I did, Miss Webster, honest. That's a help. I promise you I won't do nothing like that again, ever. I know she means that, Helen. Well, give her another chance, huh? Okay. Oh, gee, that's awful nice of you, Miss Webster. From now on, I'm going to be the smartest slob in the place. Hi, Jim. Oh, hello, Sally. Any news for a working girl? I just finished reading a report from Washington. Came in this morning's mail. On the allotment checks? That's right. What did it say? The lab examined the endorsements on the previous checks that had been paid on those three allotments. Mm-hmm. The handwriting experts of the document section say that all three endorsements were written by the same person. Now we're getting someplace. Oh, we've already opened up a file on this case. This constitutes a fraud against the government. Comes under our jurisdiction. Fine. Then we can work together. Say, uh, how's the pickup business? Well, I've only been there one night. Oh, uh-huh. how you doing? Better than I thought I would. I ran into a girl, a fellow worker... She's a little on the dumb side. Oh? She's practically admitted to me that she's working for Helen Webster. Fine. What's her name? Betty Grant. At least that's the name she uses there. Oh, I uh, may have something to report myself pretty soon. Like what? I'm having the three husbands from those allotment checks contacted. Where are they? They're all still in the service. Mm. I'm trying to see whether any of them can furnish us with a picture of his wife. Oh, that would be a big help. It's going to take a little while, though. 
They're all overseas. Oh. Meanwhile, I'm going to take an artist with me and make the rounds of the places where she cashed the previous checks. I'm going to have him make a composite picture from the various descriptions that we got. Good idea. As soon as the artist completes it, Sally, I'll come to the club and show it to you. This stool taken? No, it isn't. Mind if I sit here? Not at all. Thanks. Buy a drink? Mm, as soon as I finish this one. Like to dance? Okay. Fine, let's. Come on. I'm glad to get away from that bar. You didn't look very bored. You're not allowed to. Miss Webster doesn't like it. Uh-huh. You know something? I never knew police women dance this well. Is that a compliment? It certainly is. Then why are we stopping so soon? There's an empty table. Come on, let's occupy it. Oh, I knew this wouldn't last. Well, Sally, I've got that composite picture we were talking about. With you? Yeah. Yeah, sit here. Thanks. Here's the picture. Hmm. It's a good likeness. You know her? That's the girl I was telling you about. The blonde who calls herself Betty Grant. Is she around here now? Let me see. Mm. No, I guess not. Can you find out where she went? Might be dangerous asking questions. She'll be back in a little while anyway. How do you know that? That's the pattern. Oh, I see. You want to wait around for her? No. No, I have something to do down at police headquarters. Sally, she's the key figure in this case. If we get her, we also get Miss Webster. So give me a ring at headquarters the minute she comes in. Just a minute. Gee, I was afraid you wouldn't be home this being your night off and all. Can I come in? Yeah, sure, come on. Oh, boy, am I tired. You got a pan of hot water? Why? I want to soak my feet. I never walked so much in my whole life. Walked? Where? To the bus. What bus? The bus to Glendale Park. Then I took a trolley. After the trolley, I took a ferry across the river. And what then are I you t- talking about? How I got here to your place. I finally took a cab from the ferry. Look, and... Betty, will you start from the beginning? Where have you been? Out in the country. How did you get there? In a car. Whose car? Well, it belongs to a fellow I picked up at the club. Oh, now I get it. You're on your way to a stick-up. That's right. Why did you have to walk home? Because the stick-up never happened. Didn't Al show up? Oh, yeah, he was there. He stuck a gun in the car, just like he always does. Did the sucker grab the gun from him? No, the policeman did that. What policeman? The one who came up behind Al. Did Al get caught? Well, I got out of the car and ran, so I really couldn't say. But I think he did. Why? The policeman shot him. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Next week, from hundreds of famous and well-loved campuses, the bells of our colleges will be calling to young America. Nearly two and a half million boys and girls will respond to the call of those bells. There's a boy in our town who won't answer that bell. Name of Tom Barton. Head of his class last June in high school, a natural for college. But his dad died last spring. And now he's had to go to work to help support his mother and his three younger brothers and sisters. Every time I hear a story like that, I'm more firmly convinced than ever that the Equitable Education Fund is one of the finest of all the services performed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. What do you mean, an Equitable Education Fund? It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. 
If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, that's the answer to my problem, Mr. Keating. Guess I'd better see a man from the Equitable Society right away. Good idea, Ned. Get in touch with an Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Remember, to start an equitable education fund right away is to make certain that when the college bells of the future ring out, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to tonight's FBI file, Deadlier Than the Mail. It seems safe to say that there are very few people who are happy to see the foreign affairs of our nation in such a condition as to make it necessary for the young men of our country again to be donning uniforms. However, as you have seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there are at least some to whom the current call to colors presents an opportunity for personal gain. That there will be cheating and robbing of these youngsters is not a deterrent. For in the curious lexicon of the criminal, there is no such word as decency. The criminal is an opportunist, taking advantage of every circumstance which mitigates in his favor. Unfortunately, no law enforcement agency can prevent these crimes from being committed. All they can do is investigate afterwards and attempt to apprehend the criminal. However, you who are listening to this program can do something to help prevent the commission of such crimes. In fact, you are almost the only ones who can prevent them. Your course will not be easy because there is no ready way to recognize the criminal, either physically or mentally. If there were, the current crime wave would not be the national concern it is today. Many of you are willing and anxious to help fight that crime wave. If you are one, it is only fair to tell you that your job will not be part-time because the price of freedom from crime is... Eternal Vigilance. Tonight's file continues at local police headquarters. Jim, I've been looking for you. Uh, Sally. Sally, what are you doing here? I was invited to leave the club. By whom? Ellen Webster. Oh? What did she say? She gave it to me straight. She said one of her customers told her I was a policewoman. How did the customer know that? Because I arrested him about three months ago. See. Oh, uh, by the way, that Grant girl never did come back. Oh, I think I have an explanation for that. There's been another stick-up. Happened about an hour ago, and the FBI is in on this one. How come? It occurred on a government reservation. What's the story on it? Same pattern. Man and girl in parked car, bandit holds them up. Only this time, he didn't get away with it. What happened? A patrol car was cruising in the vicinity, saw the stick-up, and moved in. Any arrest? Yes, they got the gunman. And was Betty Grant the girl? Well, from the description the victim gave us, I think she was. I gather she wasn't picked up. No, she jumped out of the car and disappeared. Where is the gunman? He's over at Memorial Hospital. He's unconscious. Was anyone able to talk to him? No, but we have an agent in his room, hoping he'll come, too. Has this man been identified? Yes, he's a petty larceny hoodlum named Al Nelson. Sally, tell me, what's the pattern with these girls? Do they return to the Hyatt Club after a stick-up? No, I believe so. Well, that means that Betty Grant could be there right now. Yes, I wish I was still welcome there. Well, never mind about being welcome. I've got warrants here in my pocket for the arrest of Betty Grant and Helen Webster. Let's go see if we can serve them. Hello? Where are you? I'm at Claire's. Well, what are you doing there? Well, there was some trouble, and Claire asked me to call and tell you about it. What kind of trouble? Shooting. What? Where? At the place you sent me. You mean Al shot your date? No, the cops shot Al. What cops? Right after Al came up to the car, the cops came. Where's Al now? I don't know. The cops took him. How'd you get away? When Al and the cops started to make all of that noise, I ran. Was Al dead? No. Well, that's bad. What? 
If he's not dead, he might talk and ruin the whole setup. Miss Webster, I called you to tell you I'm never coming back to the club again. You say you're at Claire's? Yeah. Is she there? Yeah. What's that address? Um, 262 North Main. 260. All right, I'll be right over. Webster now. I'll get it. Is Betty still here? Yeah, come on in. Hello, Miss Webster. I knew I shouldn't have given you that second chance. Well, see, you're not going to blame those cops on me, are you? Helen, I don't think it was Betty's fault. I'm not so sure about that. Betty, did you tell a dark brunette girl in a white evening gown where you were going? I didn't tell anybody where I was going. Did you tell her anything? I talked to her at the bar for a little while. Who is this girl you're talking about? She's a new girl who's working as a hostess. Found out tonight she was a policewoman. Oh, dandy. When you were at the bar with her, Betty, what did you talk about? I don't remember. I knew she was a new girl here, and well, I was just being friendly. Betty, I think you better get out of town. Why? I'll get you a job with a friend of mine in Pittsburgh. Oh, I've never been in Pittsburgh. I'll call Fred and have him drive you there. Oh, I don't mind taking the train. I don't want you around any railroad station. Al may have talked. But, Helen, if Al talks, what happens to you? If the cops don't find Betty, they got no case against me. Oh, I see. Where's the phone, Claire? I want to call Fred. The sooner we get Betty out of town, the better. <laughs> I just spoke to the bartender. Did he know where Helen Webster went? Yes, yeah, she got a phone call and went to see Betty Grant. Yeah, she must have heard about the arrest of Al Nelson. The bartender still thinks I'm one of the girls who works here. Hey, that's fine. I wonder if he knows where Betty Grant lives. I asked him. He doesn't. Uh -huh. Anyone else around here who might have that information? No, I don't think so. I checked with some of the other girls and the doorman. No. Couldn't give me a thing. Of course, you know, it's possible she isn't even at home. Miss Webster could have just had a date to meet her someplace. Do you say you talked to the doorman? Yes. Did he see Miss Webster leave? Yes, she took a cab. Well, he could have overheard her give the address to the cab driver. I checked that too, Jim. And? He said she had an address written down on a sheet of paper when she came out. He didn't hear her tell the cab driver anything. Uh, well, does he remember which cab she took? No. All right, that leaves us just about where we started. And time may be running out. You mean for Betty Grant? Yes. While you were asking questions, I called Memorial Hospital. Al Nelson died about 20 minutes ago. Oh, that's bad. So Betty Grant is really our only witness now. If Helen Webster can get her out of the way, we'll have trouble proving a case. Do you know where Miss Webster got that phone call? The bartender said she got it in her office. In her office. Where's that? Through that door in the rear. Hmm. Helen Webster had that address written down. Let's go have a look in her office. Without knowing it, she might have left a copy for us. <laughs> I might as well tell you so you won't start screaming. Tell me what? When Fred comes up here, he's going to give it to your friend in the next room. But you said you were going to get her a job in Pittsburgh. I don't like to see anybody get killed, Claire, but this girl's a menace. This thing tonight wasn't her fault. Whose fault is it if she talks to a policewoman? But that policewoman even had you fooled. I didn't tell her anything. Your friend did. Look, you can't do this, Helen. No. You'll never get away with it. Why not? Because I'm not going to see her killed. If Fred shoots her, I'll go to the cops myself. Thanks for telling me. I'll talk to Fred about you, too. Oh, is that my chauffeur, Miss Webster? Oh, uh, yeah, dear. Get your coat. Coming. That's Helen Webster, Jim. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I have a warrant here for your arrest. What? What are you talking about? We'll find out, lady. Oh, hi, Sally. Betty, she's a cop, don't you remember? Oh. The blonde girl is Betty Grant, Jim. The other girl works for Helen, too. Okay. How did you know we were here? We examined the pad on which Miss Webster wrote this address. She wrote heavily enough to indent the next couple of pages with a very legible impression. Oh. Sally, it's getting late. I think we'd better get this trio down to headquarters. <laughs> Hello.
Helen Webster was tried in federal court for robbery on a government reservation and given a 20-year sentence. Betty Grant received a five-year sentence for violation of the Veterans Dependency Act. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was closed successfully because of two things. The first was the close cooperation of your FBI and the local police force. Cooperation without which your FBI would be unable to have built the spectacular record for success which it now enjoys. The second factor which helped bring this case to a conclusion was the indented writing Special Agent Taylor found on the pad next to Helen Webster's telephone. Anyone could have found the pad, but knowing how to read indented writing is a skill which has taught every special agent as a part of the course he takes to prepare for his job. And thus, the criminal careers of these women were halted. Each year, the number of women arrested grows larger, and in the past 12 months, almost 10% more women were arrested than in any other year on record. To make the distaff side of the crime picture even darker, almost 50% of the women arrested had previous arrest records. Most of these crimes were local in nature, so that you, the listener, can make a real contribution toward the control of crime in your neighborhood. You can do that by seeing to it that you have a strong local police force. If that result is achieved, your FBI will feel very well repaid for having cooperated in bringing you this program tonight. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now we have time for one more quick question on the Equitable Education Fund. Have you got one, Ned? Yes, Mr. Keating. Suppose I start a fund for that boy of mine now. Then when he's 17, he decides he doesn't want any more education. And what happens then? Well, the fund is always your money, Ned. If your boy votes against going to college, you can use the proceeds of the fund in any way you see fit. The really important thing is to start one soon. Get in touch with your equitable representative without delay. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A dramatic depiction of the operations of a professional killer. Its subject... Flight to avoid prosecution. Its title, The Innocent Fugitive. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Innocent Fugitive on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.